The JFK 35 podcast is made possible through generous support from the Blanche and Irving Lorry Foundation. Classrooms are important, but really knowledge is, is available in a democracy to everyone. That's new archivist of the United States, Dr. Colleen Shogan, on the importance of the National Archives and making historic documents, recordings, and photos available to the public. Shogun is the 11th archivist of the United States and the first woman to hold the position. Our interview with her and how she hopes presidential libraries will play a key role in civics education across America, next on this episode of JFK 35. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Hello, I'm Matt Porter. And I'm Jamie Richardson. Welcome to this episode of JFK 35. John F. Kennedy said as a U.S. Senator, unless we assess fairly the actions of the past, we have no sound basis upon which to plan for the future. Today, the National Archives and Records Administration is the chief executive agency that oversees the protection and dissemination of governmental and historic records of the United States. Those records include documents, recordings, photos, and other artifacts kept at 15 presidential libraries across the United States, including right here at the JFK Presidential Library and Museum in Boston. The history of the National Archives began in 1934, when Congress passed and President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed legislation establishing the National Archives to preserve and care for the records of the U.S. government. Because of that law, every president beginning with Herbert Hoover has had their records preserved by the National Archives. There have been 11 archivists of the United States to lead the National Archives since its inception. Dr. Colleen Shogun was appointed by President Joe Biden and confirmed by the Senate last year. She is the first woman to hold the post. Dr. Shogun served as Senior Vice President and Director of the David M. Rubenstein Center at the White House Historical Association. She also previously worked in the United States Senate and as a senior executive at the Library of Congress. Dr. Shogun, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here today. So you are the 11th archivist of the United States and the first woman to lead the agency. Uh, You also came from outside the National Archives system with your previous job at the White House Historical Association, part of the David M. Rubenstein Center. Uh, What has been your biggest challenge and the most satisfying accomplishment you've had so far? I would say when I came on board to the National Archives, there was a a very important challenge in front of me, uh, and that was that during the pandemic, there had been a backlog accumulated of requests for our veterans' records at the National Archives. And in fact, the backlog had grown to almost 600,000 requests, so quite a large backlog uh, during the pandemic. And this is really quite important because... By providing veterans with their records and their families with their records, they can claim their benefits, uh, which might include housing benefits, job benefits, disability benefits. And having that that large of a backlog uh, was a real concern because that's, of course, a population we're very sensitive to providing uh, superior service to. So uh, what, during my confirmation hearings and when I met with senators and members of Congress prior to my confirmation, I pledged that that would be a top priority for me whenever I was uh, confirmed as archivist of the United States. And in January of this year of 2024, we were able at the National Archives to completely eliminate that backlog, which was a, a really amazing achievement from our staff at the National Archives at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis. And we recent, I recently went out to St. Louis and celebrated with all 600 staff members who work at that location, who very diligently worked overtime. They came in on federal holidays. They came in on the weekends so that uh, the backlog could be eliminated and they could restore our service, our regular service to our veterans, which I can say very safely that that is the case today at the National Archives. So that was very satisfying to be able to do that and to make sure that we are on track for providing records to that population. That is quite the accomplishment and congratulations on getting that backlog down. Now, one of the early interviews after you took this job, you describe yourself as a political scientist, not a historian, and that your introduction to the National Archives was through actually the presidential library system. Can you tell us about your experience being introduced through the presidential libraries and how your background in political science adds to your experience and your role? 
Absolutely. Uh, so that's that's true. Uh, my research as uh, someone who specialized in the presidency as a political scientist made sure that I, I experienced and worked with presidential libraries throughout my career in academia, but then also in other positions, uh, particularly when I worked at the White House Historical Association. But my first introduction to the presidential library system was not when I was a political scientist. It was when I was an undergraduate uh, in college, when I attended Boston College. And the library that I used to go to was the Kennedy Library in Boston. And the reason that I went there was, I, I it was it's such a beautiful location. I really enjoyed going to the library. And what happened was I, I grew up in Pittsburgh. And whenever I would go through, I would do the finals, our finals at Boston College, sometimes Sometimes I would have a day or two before I had to fly back to Pittsburgh, whether it was the end of the winter semester or the spring semester. And oftentimes I would spend that extra day at the Kennedy Library. I would take the, the tea to uh, all the way out to the Kennedy Library. It was a little bit of a long ride and spend the entire day there, go through the museum, have lunch there and then go back. And I just found it as a, a terrific way, a very peaceful way and a very enjoyable day to mark the end of, of my semester. And I did that throughout my time at, at Boston College. So I spent many happy days uh, at the Kennedy Library. As a, a political scientist, you know, I was able to use the libraries for a number of different research projects that I was involved with. Most recently, I, I used it at the Clinton Library for a uh, project that I was doing on President Clinton's Oklahoma City bombing speech. I was writing um, a analysis of that speech and had a, really a great interaction with some of the archivists there who were able to send me. Uh, at that point in time, there wasn't digitization, so they sent me photocopies of uh, the box where all those records uh, had had been uh, accumulated, and I was able to see speechwriter's notes on the speeches, and most importantly, I was able to see President Clinton's notes on, on the speech, so I could see how he changed the speech in important ways. And when I was at the White House Historical Association, I wrote an article on President Eisenhower and how he used his farm at Gettysburg as a shadow White House, uh, particularly when he was recovering from his heart attack when he was president. And I was able to, to travel to, to Eisenhower's farm in Gettysburg and visit that location. But then I was able to read oral histories from uh, the uh, actually the FBI agents that were stationed at the Gettysburg Farmhouse, President Eisenhower and Mrs. Eisenhower, and really get a firsthand account of what it was like when President Eisenhower was recuperating from that heart attack and how he used that residence as his surrogate White House uh, during that interim period. So you really can find information at presidential libraries that you would just not find anywhere else as a researcher. There's nowhere else that you would be able to find Bill Clinton's comments on his Oklahoma City bombing speech. There's nowhere else where you would be able to get firsthand accounts of, of something related to President Eisenhower's presidency, people that were actually observing him uh, during his presidency. So our, our presidential libraries are really the gateway to our knowledge and how we interpret previous presidential administrations and really how we interpret the politics and history of particular eras of American history. Thank you. That's such a, sometimes it seems like being a researcher sounds like a lot of fun to get to, to kind of dive into all of those things. Uh, but so kind of talking about Nash, the National Archives a little bit um, as a whole, do you think the public has a strong understanding of what the role of the National Archives is or if its existence or any of these things? And then how do you think you and your role can go about educating people about its importance and the materials they make available to the public? I think this is a great question. I think that if you had asked, uh, if you had had this as a survey question a few years ago, I think that most people would not really be able to articulate too much about the National Archives, except maybe that they had uh, remembered it from the movie National Treasure, or if they had been lucky enough to come to Washington, D.C., they may have uh, visited the National Archives as a tourist to see our founding documents uh, here at Washington, D.C. We're, we're right off the, the mall, right near the Smithsonian Museums. So we do have a, a really heavy uh, visitor and tourist presence here at the National Archives. But now, since there's been more coverage of the National Archives in the news, we do have more people that are curious 
about the National Archives and what we do here as our nation's uh, record keeper. And so what I've done to try to promote this in, in a number of ways, um, first, uh, when I travel around the country to visit our various archival locations across the country and our presidential libraries. We have 42 separate facilities all across the United States, including our facilities in the Washington DC area. So I do uh, engage in a fair amount of travel. And when I, I travel around the country, I try to plan, if I can, public events in conjunction uh, with those visits to visit NARA staff members and our facilities in things like you know public libraries or other uh, universities, places where we can gather uh, groups of people, also put that online, and I can have discussions about our mission at the National Archives and, and what we do. So that's one way in which I engage. I try to do as much media as possible, things like podcasts, uh, things like talking to reporters, so we're able to get our message out. And then we also have a, a robust social media presence at the National Archives for our various facilities, but I have a social media presence on several platforms. So people are able to see what I'm doing on a daily basis, who I'm speaking with, what I'm talking about, and so that I can also share some of our nation's most prominent records with as many Americans as possible. Thank you. And so you mentioned national treasure. And so sometimes people think of archivists and librarians and movies often as kind of treasure hunters or tomb raiders, or kind of the opposite of the sort of bespectacled hermit who's kind of crowded away in a corner. But what do you think would be a better or greater portrayal of archivists and librarians from your experience? Well, I mean, I do, I will say that I really love the national treasure movies. I, I you know, uh, anytime that I see national treasure on television, I like to watch a few minutes and we feature it here at the National Archives with kids as a way to get interested in history. And I certainly love Indiana Jones and have seen all those mo movies more than once. Uh, so I, I kind of do enjoy that type of aspect of it, but I am a mystery novelist. So I think that, you know, archivists and librarians make pretty good uh, detectives. They're pretty good history detectives. So I think that's always fun whenever I, um, I and in fact, when I read a book that maybe has an intersection of, uh, I like mysteries, so intersection of, of history and mysteries, or we, there was a librarian there's you know some books out there that the librarians are actually the detectives and they're they're solving the murders or the cases uh so I, I really do enjoy those because it brings together some of the things that i really love all in one book or all in one movie um, aurora tea garden is 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 a good is a good example right <laughs> um and she's got books and movies <laughs> I'm a huge fan of all the National Treasure movies as as well. I love that they've made movies dedicated to looking into American history. You've had the chance, as you've just mentioned, to visit, I think, almost all the libraries now in the system. And uh, you've referenced President Reagan, who called presidential libraries, uh, quote, labs of democracy, end quote. How do you think libraries play that role now in the 21st century? Absolutely. I, I, you know, and I don't think it's changed much since what President Reagan said when his library opened, what he called uh, his own library and all the presidential libraries as labs of democracy. What I think is really important is that our, and I referenced this before, is that our presidential libraries obviously tell the story of a particular administration. Kennedy Library focusing on the administration of, of John F. Kennedy, for example. But it's really, it's a little more than that. It's, it's about the history of that particular time period and all the things that happened in the United States, foreign and domestic, uh, and even culturally in that time period. So it's a, it's a really great way in which we can get kids, for example, to come look at the images, understand something substantively about history, but even more importantly, just get excited about history. So if they come and have a good experience, at the Kennedy Library or another one of our presidential libraries, then hopefully they'll be curious to go to more libraries. They'll be curious to go to more history related museums. And then eventually they'll be reading books uh, about history and be excited about learning more. The other thing that I think it's very important is that our presidential libraries do quite well, all of our presidential libraries, is they put the presidency in its proper context. We know that the president is an incredibly important political actor in, in our governing system. However, the president is not the only institution. He's not the only actor in our governing system, in our constitution. There's Congress. 
there's the courts, there's the bureaucracy, right? So there are other uh, entities that are very important about decisions about how we are governed. And I think our presidential libraries do a very good service in placing the president within that constitutional system, within that constitutional democracy, so that young people, when they come to our museums, they understand that while the presidency is an important ingredient, it is not the only ingredient for American government. And across the country, we're seeing kind of a renewed focus in many states and school districts on teaching civics as part of their curriculums. How do you view the National Archives role and in particular presidential libraries in these efforts, especially in an election year? Yes, it's uh, very important to engage with civics, all of the national archives and, of course, our our presidential libraries. So we have a, a very active program called Civics for All of Us, in which we teach civics, modules of civics here in in Washington, D.C., virtually. And then we also distribute that curriculum all throughout our national archive system, including with our presidential library system, so that we can share that information to uh, our nation's classrooms across the United States. We are going to be doubling down on these programs here at the National Archives in the coming year because we want to be very prepared for 2026, which is, of course, the 250th anniversary uh, or birthday of the United States. And we think there will be renewed interest in our history, in evaluating our nation's history and thinking about what comes next for the United States. What are our priorities as a nation? Taking stock of how far we've come in fulfilling the promises and the principles contained in the Declaration of Independence and what work do we have yet to do still in the next 250 years in the life of the democracy. And the only way we can have those kinds of really interesting and fun and exciting conversations is if we have kids and 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 young people that understand the basic rules of the game, that understand the principles as they're outlined. We can have debates about those principles, but understand what they are. And then also, uh, obviously, how our government works, which is laid out in, as a blueprint in the Constitution. So I view our work in civics as really enabling our nation's classrooms, our young people, to be able to have the more advanced and interesting conversations that we want to have in the next couple of years. And there's no better place that can do that in a a nonpartisan, very factual type of way than the National Archives. And then kind of on the flip side of that, there's also been a response against teaching specific histories. I mean, one example is our, you know, complicated past with slavery. How do you as the leader of the National Archives respond to that type of movement? We've made thousands and thousands of teaching documents online with our Docs Teach program. And so we provide all of these resources available for teachers, not only teachers, I mean, they're available to anyone, they're also available to students. So we are not in any way, shape or form running away from our very complicated history here in the United States. We are providing you with the records, or you uh, collectively, the American people with the records, including teachers and students, so that they can evaluate our complicated history, evaluate these facts, for themselves. Uh, and I think that's the, the the most important thing that we can do at the National Archives. We don't try to put a real heavy touch with providing those records. We will provide some historical context so you know what you're looking at, you know, what era am I looking at, who's in the picture, uh, you know, what's this document about? We have to provide that. But as far as that is in the sequence of a, a, a long string of events that are leading up to it and the interpretation of those events, that's really up for, and that's part of a democracy, that's up for the, the citizens of a democracy to evaluate and decide for themselves, including young people, of course, you know, growing more advanced as they move uh, throughout the system. I think that also, I would just say this, as, as far as uh, some of the things that um, uh, you've referenced, I think it's really important libraries and archives and museums as well are incredibly important for young people because there's really very little restrictions when you go into a a library or an archive or a museum. Uh, When I was young, I had a I grew up outside of Pittsburgh, but there was a small library in my town, you know, a community library. 
And I used to love to go there. Now, I would usually go there on the weekend to do something, to like look for a particular book. Uh, there wasn't anything that was online at that point in time, um, uh, but look for a particular book or, or a magazine or, or, or a reference that I needed for s some class I was taking in high school. But I never really stopped there. I mean, that was, I had to do my work. Maybe that took an hour or something. But then I would end up spending a couple more hours at the library. And this is a small library, not even a research library. And if you just start to walk around and look at the shelves and you start to pull books off the shelves and start to look at, at, at different things that you are able to find, really you discover that Classrooms are important, but really knowledge is is available in a democracy to everyone. Uh, and I think that I took control actually of my own education, largely in a library, in a in a in a community library, where I started to find books that you know I that I wasn't assigned in in high school, but I was starting to find information that was out there that I didn't even know existed. So I really encourage kids, even apart from their formal education, now you have the internet, you have a lot of different ways in which you can gain access to information. I encourage them to be curious and go out there and find the answers for themselves and make up their own minds. And we've talked a lot about the education of young people, but what about adults of all ages and even government officials, maybe to an extent? How does NARA play a role in also uh, educating those groups? Sure. I mean, we take uh, we do a lot of uh, programs here at the National Archives. I'm going to have a great conversation coming up in a few weeks uh, with Jeffrey Rosen, who's the executive director of the National Constitutional Center. He's written a terrific book on the opening paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. So we're going to talk about uh, what the pursuit of happiness means here at the National Archives. And that's sort of uh, part of our adult education about one of our important founding documents. And we obviously uh, do a lot of these conversations in person here now at the archives, now at the conclusion of the pandemic. But we are making those conversations and events virtual uh, and I you know we are promoting them as as much as possible but every day that we're open here in Washington DC or that any of our uh, facilities are open across the United States including our presidential libraries we have people adult including adults coming in and learning about our nation's history maybe learning about their own personal history their own family history their own local history or of course, the role of the United States in the world. And I think, you know, we are very big fans here at the National Archives of lifelong learning. And that's what we, we absolutely want to encourage. If you come here to the National Archives and you don't learn and you're an adult and you don't learn something during your visit, something about the history of the United States, uh, then we've, we've absolutely failed. So I dare you to come and, and, and not learn something after spending an hour with us here at the National Archives. That's great. I love that. And so there are many people, though, who are unable to travel to uh, the National Archives, any of the sites are in DC. But fortunately, many of the holdings have been digitized, and the process is ongoing and will probably last forever. But what, what else would you like to see in the future for a digital archive? Yes. So that's, uh, yes, the digital, providing our documents digitally and providing our collection digitally is incredibly important just for the reason that you mentioned, because as much as I want to open the doors and I would, you know, if I could, I would stand out on Constitution Avenue and bring as many people in as, as possible. We know that not everybody travels to Washington, D.C. And maybe someone in Seattle, Washington is never going to be able to travel to visit the Kennedy Library in person. But you want that individual to have as good as an experience as possible if he or she wants to learn more about the legacy of the Kennedy presidency and the Kennedy White House. Uh, so we are digitizing as, as quickly as possible. We are opening a new national digitization center here in, outside of Washington, D.C. in our College Park, Maryland location. Uh, that's going to be very exciting. And that will enable us at the National Archives to digitize our textual documents and collect the, the important categorical data, we call it metadata, that can help identify those documents, help us do that at, at a much quicker pace and than what we were doing before. So right now we have a close to 300 million documents and records online at our National Archives catalog. We're also working to improve the search mechanisms of that catalog. So we would like to go to 500 million by 2026, and we hope to be able to reach that level. 
And we're also working to, to figure out ways in which we can make some of our experiences, such as visiting the Rotunda here in Washington, D.C., how we can translate that experience online. Of course, we've digitized the Declaration and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, so you can see those close up online. But how can we replicate that experience of walking through the rotunda as a digital experience? And that's something we're thinking about for 2026 as well, because we not know not everyone is going to be able to walk inside that rotunda to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the United States. So what can we do in a virtual or digital way to provide that experience to any American that wants to actually engage in that way? It's really wonderful. And, you, you know, you mentioned the rotunda. What the most iconic part of sort of, you know, the National Archives is that rotunda in Washington, D.C., where you can see the founding documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and Bill of Rights. But I do understand you're hoping to add a third document into the rotunda, and that is the Emancipation Proclamation. Why is it so important to bring that document into the rotunda alongside those other two documents from the 1700s? I think it's very important because it is it represents a refounding of the republic. Some people view founding documents as, you know, wedded to particular moments in time. 1776, 1787, right? We you know, those are the dates that we typically view as a founding of the American democracy or a starting point for American democracy tied to those documents. But in reality, you know, what Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and a lot of our great thinkers, Frederick Douglass said, was that the American polity, our American democracy is actually refounded all the time because we continually seek to refine those principles and try to find ways in which we can embody those principles that are outlined in the original founding documents. And the Emancipation Proclamation is a, is a, is a great example of that. Now, is it the end-all, be-all of civil rights for African Americans? Is it the end of inclusivity? No. In, in actuality, it's just the beginning. So I think that's another uh, good reason for it to be uh, on display as well. It it's, does not tell the whole story, just like the Declaration and the Constitution don't tell our entire story, but it, it is a, an important inflection point in American history for when we start to move towards the greater fulfillment of those principles. So uh, I think for telling We've now we're now 250 years, almost 250 years into the American experiment. It was never meant to be a static a democracy. It was always meant to be uh, what Woodrow Wilson called it, an organic democracy that would always be evolving and changing. And so uh, as a reflection of that, our interpretation of our most important documents also needs to evolve and change. Uh, and we can consistently add to those documents for further interpretation. And so you mentioned earlier, one of your talents and hobbies is writing mystery novels. Uh, so does that creativity in writing help you inform your approach to helping tell the story of the, our nation's history? That's a great question. I, I you know, uh, I came to creative writing a little bit later in, in my career. And quite frankly, I'd never been a creative writer before. I'd been purely a political scientist, an academic writer, a nonfiction writer. And uh, I came to writing by almost uh, by accident, a creative writing by accident. I think it does. I think it does uh, affect how I think about telling stories, the importance of character, the importance of description. And also, I'm always encouraging our staff here at the National Archives, how can we do things in a how can we com communicate information? How can we communicate information about history? in fun and exciting ways uh, that people can identify with. And, uh, you know, that creativity can be in, in a mystery novel. Uh, that creativity can be how we display information in a video, how we display it online, in our social media. We, we do have to be cognizant that although we deal with very serious subjects here at the National Archives, we can also have fun with those topics and with those subjects so that we can entice people all the way from kids to adults to want to engage with us and, and learn more. And I think that's, that's a fantastic way in which to do it. Really, really interesting side hobby. So our final question is, every president has left their mark on the country. And since Franklin Roosevelt established the presidential library system, you know, the archives has been able to preserve these records of their service and impact. 
since this is a John F. Kennedy focused podcast, uh, what parts of JFK's legacy resonate with you and the work you're doing at the archives? That's a great question to end with. And uh, unquestionably, I think that President Kennedy's greatest legacy, although there's many, his greatest legacy has to be public service because that's what President Kennedy was about. That's what uh, President Kennedy's family uh, was about. And uh, his greatest challenge, of course, to a whole generation of Americans is not to think so, so much of themselves, but to think about what they can do, what they can do for the betterment of their fellow man and, and for their country. And uh, we really need a reconsideration of the importance of public service in this country. And that's where presidential libraries can also be incredibly helpful. Places like the Kennedy Library, other uh, places as well, like the George H.W. Bush Library in Texas, because it chronicles President Bush's long career, which even before he became president, of course, he served in many different capacities in public service be before becoming president of the United States, but it was largely a career steeped in public service. And when young people go and see that actual arc and learn something about President Kennedy's life and about President Bush's life, they can be inspired as well. And they can say, hey, I can, I can make a difference as well. There are many also, there's many options available to me, even outside of serving in politics, in which I can be a public servant. I can serve my local community. I can serve my state. I can serve my country. And some people you know, go on uh, to careers that actually serve globally. So uh, I really view that as the most important part of President Kennedy's legacy and, and certainly his inspiration for generations, his generation of young people getting involved in public service, but but actually reaching all the way up, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later. And that's something that I'm sure the Kennedy Library and the Kennedy Foundation is very proud about. Well, thank you, Archivist Shogun, for joining us. Really appreciate it for you taking the time to talk to us today. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our special interview with archivist Colleen Shogun. If you're interested in learning more about Dr. Shogun and the work of the National Archives, check out our podcast page at jfklibrary.org jfk35 for additional content from today's episode. If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at jfklibrary using the hashtag jfk35. If you like what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and have a great week.